Welcome to the Digital Hollywood panel uh, for Advertising, Branding Strategies, and Creativity 2020, The New Universe. When this was initially conceived of, uh, it was a little before uh, the situation we all find ourselves in now, um, spending a lot of time at home and with loved ones and with uh, content silos we hadn't used before and with apps that we hadn't spent as much time with. And so we, we've got an interesting group. A real, first off, we have a fantastic panel. Um, I'll introduce them by name and then each one of them can, can introduce themselves. But we have Tina Pukonen, who's the head of entertainment strategy from Pinterest. We have Andrew Solmson, who's the president uh, for California for Wonderman Thompson, a large ad agency. And Autumn Nazarian, who's SVP content, sponsorship and partnerships at Mindshare. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the mic uh, to Tina first. Tina, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do at Pinterest and take it away. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. And uh, thanks for having me on the panel today. Excited to be here. Um, my role at Pinterest is really to help um, understand the way that consumers um, and our users, we call them pinners, um, are using the platform and to really glean insights that can help marketers, in particular entertainment marketers, uh, better use the platform to connect with consumers, to advertise some of their new products that are coming out, new movies, new TV shows, video games, audio podcasts, all of those encompass what we think of as entertainment. Wonderful. Well, thank you and welcome. Andrew, you're next. Tell us about Wonderman Thompson and what brings you here. Ian, thank you, and apologies that uh, part of this new reality is that today my video is deciding not to work on this particular platform, so um, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to follow along. I'm sorry you're not able to see me. So Wonderman Thompson, which is uh, WPP's largest agency, we came together just 18 months ago as we brought together uh, JWT, Wonderman, Possible, where I had come from, and a number of other agencies. and. First and foremost, we think about ourselves as a customer experience agency. The total focus on what the customer is doing and my focus, as it has been for the past 25 years, is around digital customer experience. And more now more than ever, figuring out how we can get the right message in front of the right person and how we can create a customer experience that really makes a relationship with the brand that is far, far stronger than it ever could be in the past. Excellent. Thank you and welcome. And last but certainly not least, Autumn Nazarian. Hey, and thanks. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Autumn and I am an, a senior vice president um, under the Content Plus department, um, leading the sponsorship discipline for the US for Mindshare. Um, I have a long background with entertainment, sports, cause, music, et cetera. I actually started in television 20 something years ago. Um, but for the last 18 years, I've actually been with Group M and now with Mindshare. Um, and in my current role, um, as I said, I lead the, the sponsorship and partnerships discipline under Content Plus. We are a department within the media agency that helps our clients think about uh, non-traditional big ideas, um, everything from content strategy to branded entertainment, and then in my group specifically, uh, looking at how to identify and negotiate with entertainment and sports partnerships um, to, to really uh, bring those big campaigns to life. And we work, of course, hand in hand with the media team. So we're able to create these really intimate moments of sponsorships and partnerships, but uh, leverage the scale of media. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's stay with you, Autumn. What new opportunity? Well, let's, let's, how's the pandemic changed the way your organization is servicing your clients? It, it's uh, it's actually really surprising. Uh, we we really did have a running start when we had um, been doing some tests to see how the organization could work from home before the actual stay at home orders happened, and and so we actually from day one uh, really had a plan in place to use video conferencing and all the different networking tools that that we needed to to keep up that conversation. Um, but then beyond that, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we have an insights group that's creating uh, weekly to bi-weekly consumer insight reports. And so that's helping us keep a real pulse um, week to week for our clients in terms of how people are feeling um, personally, as well as how they're acting, what kind of activities they're leaning into. 
um, as well as what they expect from brands. And that's, that's a big one. Um, in addition to that, we've also created a dashboard that we're sharing with clients that really helps us look at the local data, because as we know, this pandemic is national, but there are huge differences when it comes to the local response. Um, and so we're really leaning into a lot of data there, not to be predictive necessarily, but to be informed uh, really like minute to minute so that we can keep an eye on, on the situation as we're in the middle of the pandemic and then headed towards recovery. Got it. Andrew, Wonderman Thompson's known for own data. What are you guys seeing? Well, this has been obviously challenging in so many ways, but also a pretty interesting opportunity for someone who owns a lot of data to do some interesting work with it. We've been doing these COVID ready briefings for the last nine weeks. We do them every Friday morning for our internal staff and for our clients. And you know, we've built up a trove. We have data on over 265 million Americans. And what we've done is we've used that data to create what we call a risk and readiness assessment. And uh, you know you can check it out. I'll, I'll paste the link into the chat. Um, and you can manipulate the data. And what we've done is we've taken our demographic data and then put Johns Hopkins COVID data on top of that. And then all of that goes through um, uh, Watson AI. And that lets you see at a county level how much risk and how ready that county is for every county in the country. And what's really interesting about that is we're in a place that brands have never been in before, which is each market is in a totally, totally different mental state. And this has never existed before. I mean, of course, we've had markets that have been hit by a hurricane or a market that had an earthquake or a great fire. That's been material, but we've never had the breadth of places where people um, are that is such a different kind of mental state for them. Wow. Um, Tina, what are the most compelling shifts and trends you've seen uh, in consumer user behavior or brand behavior? Yeah, we've seen um, some tremendous shifts. We're actually seeing record engagement on Pinterest. We're up about 60% year over year as people are at home and they have more time. But more than that, as they need ideas and inspiration more than ever. You know, our mission has always been to bring inspiration to people to create a life they love. And creating a life they love has always begun in your home. And now that our entire life is taking place in the home, we've seen a real surge in people looking for ideas for every day or for the now, um, which is a little bit different than I think how a lot of people think about Pinterest as planning kind of future events and activities that are gonna happen. Um, that is still happening. And we've actually in the last couple of weeks seen a shift um, to people starting to look again at planning those those uh, events that are going to be coming up, whether that's a summer vacation or even the holidays. We're seeing really early planning for holidays this year, which are going to be a little bit different. But I think with this renewed focus on the way that we're living our lives at home, we're seeing that people were coming to look for things they really hadn't looked for before. How to work from home, how to set up your home office. How do you teach your kids at home? Um, and of course, entertainment searches have surged. People looking for ideas for movies they can watch, TV shows they can watch, you know, entertainment to keep their kids occupied. Um, and in response to this, we've actually launched a new experience called the Today tab on Pinterest that's updated every day with ideas that people are looking for live on the platform. Um, and the other thing we've done in terms of uh, working a little bit differently also with the brands that we partner with is um, we're also providing weekly insights. Pinterest, because Pinterest is a platform where people come to plan early, we often have a view into what's going to happen a little bit earlier than some of the other um, platforms out there that are measuring data and measuring sentiment and what people are actually thinking about and looking for. Um, and we've heard feedback from a lot of our agencies that we work with and the marketers that we work with that these have really helped them to think about um, how they could market a little bit differently and the kind of messages you know that they should be putting um, out into the world to kind of really meet people where they are right now. Got it. 
I, I know in my own household, uh, my wife uses Pinterest as her exo cortex. And so uh, all of the projects that we've planned early or late uh, seem to have come through Pinterest. So thank you for that. Um, let's stay there. What, what are those trends and, and changes do you think are going to stick after we all are permitted to leave our homes again? Yeah, well, I, I think there's no doubt there's been an acceleration in the way people are using technology to answer those needs that they have, you know, kind of new needs. And whether that's ordering groceries or dinner that's going to be delivered to your home, you know, renting new movies on premium VOD, which is a new experience, um, or even subscribing to new streaming services to keep, you know, yourself and your family busy and entertained. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, working remotely over video, doing a video conference like we are now, and then catching up with friends and family. So I think a lot of those things are not going to go away. Um, certainly anything that brings convenience, ease, and value to our lives, you know, something we need, um, even post-pandemic with people being busy. Um, but I do think that a lot of people are going to be really anxious to spend more personal one-on-one -on -one time in, you know, in person with friends and family. Um, so I think that may be something that uh, we may see kind of shift back. But I think everything else has just been an acceleration of trends that were already happening and uh, there's probably no going back. Got it. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, on Pinterest, I know there are influencers, right? People who have their own pin boards and, and influence others. I'm wondering, uh, and Autumn, you mentioned something in our setup call, a fantastic term that I want you to introduce and, and, and uh, define uh, around athletics. Um, strategic planning as it goes forward, particularly around sports and entertainment. Um, what's going to change? How's it changed? Tell us a little bit about that. Is that to me? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so time will tell, right? It's, it's hard to be completely predictive about um, what the future will hold, but we do see quite a few clues. Uh, we're seeing that uh, athletes and entertainers are taking to their own webcams to put on private concerts, uh, to work out with their fans, to really take the time to, to check in with their fan base. Um, so with the absence of sports right now, um, that's, that's a huge trend we're seeing. Um, obviously, there's been a huge surge in terms of the, the viewership of gaming content. Um, and so we're definitely seeing that, uh, you know, again, the absence of sports has created a bit of a, an opportunity for gaming and esports to really grab the imagination of people who are hungry for live competitive games. Um, and so, uh, so we're definitely seeing a, a surge there, and um, we we don't necessarily know if it will sustain or not once professional sports are back. But it's it's definitely engaging and, and grabbing the imagination of viewers. Um, and I think that you know, a big part of this hunger is that uh, sports is is different than entertainment. In some ways, entertainment can be a passive activity. Um, whereas sports, as a fan, you have active engagement, you have your tribe, you have that local uh, passion. And, um, and, and so some of that is shifting to entertainment, where people are going online and talking about content more than ever. Um, but, but a lot of it is shifting over to gaming and esports as well. Um, and as sports continue to open up, it'll be fascinating to watch, you know, what happens there. You mentioned... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, we're seeing a similar surge. And I, you know, I would say, you know, in anything related to fandom, whether that's, you know, fandom for entertainment show, shows and movies that you love or sports teams, um, athletes that you love, musicians. And I do think that something interesting has shifted, you know, as you mentioned, Autumn, that uh, a lot of athletes, musicians, celebrities, you know, are coming to you live from their living rooms or even welcoming people into live chats. Um, and I think I think that's really fascinating. And I, I feel like something that was previously very exclusive has become quite inclusive as that access has opened up. And um, I'll be curious to see, you know, how entertainment marketers especially kind of continue to leverage that because I feel like fans are going to have a slightly different expectation um, coming out of that. But we've definitely seen uh, a tremendous surge in people looking for ideas of how to kind of bring kind of their favorite uh, their favorite IP, their favorite athletes into their world. We even saw, um, I, I think within sports especially, it's interesting because um, there isn't a lot to engage with 
sort of live. Um, but as certain things have happened, like the NFL draft, we saw that uh, people were coming onto Pinterest and searching for um, some of the the star athletes around the draft, or when the Michael Jackson doc or sorry, Michael Jordan documentary launched, people were looking for information about him and about sort of basketball in general and the history of basketball. And so I think um, you know fandom has definitely enjoyed uh, a surge during this time. And I think that the the way that we think about how fans relate to the the people and sort of the, the properties that they care about most um would be interesting to see how that shifts that's interesting Definitely. and the term the term that uh, ian is referring to is if it's hard to pronounce but i was saying affluencers um because we are seeing more pro athletes behave like influencers and that that made sound like shade. It's not, um, it just means that, you know, maybe that that line of access has opened up in a, in a much different way due to the fact that they too are at home creating their own content. Um, and so they are looking for interaction as much as their their fans. Well, as both of you were saying, and saying really well, there's this real desire for richer digital experiences. And I think, you know, we, we may have been at We'll see, but we may have been at the high watermark of people wanting as quick and light digital experiences as we'll ever see. And obviously you have this kind of incredible canary in a coal mine in Quibi right now, right? Quibi launched um, and I think there was some doubt whether it would be a proposition that would work in the world from three months ago. But in the current world where there's this interest in depth there's this bit more time perhaps for a lot of people to go deeper. This, the lighter, quicker hits, those are a little less desirable. And what we're seeing in TikTok, for instance, is there were so many people who were and continue to consume content, but what we're seeing is many, many, many more people making content. And you know, not at the professional level, not at the influencer level, but just at the home level that's become a thing to do among kids and among families uh, to stave off boredom. And so that this depth is really changing the way we're consuming content. Does it change the way you promote content currently? Yeah, it, it really does. So right now is a, it's a bit of a terrifying time, right? Like I would not want to be doing a national ad buy for a TV spot because what do you say, right? And you know, we, we divide, the the municipalities and, and the areas of the country into three areas right? and the first is acute outbreak and when you are in acute outbreak like you know don't when my house is on fire please don't come and bring me a cake i'm sure it's a really nice cake but my house is on fire the only thing i'm interested in the hose is the hose and the only and, and someone telling me uh, that we're sorry we know it's hard we're supporting we're giving money we're doing these things to act responsibly and you're gonna get, and you've seen it a lot, crazy backlash, you can't see that. The second phase is recovery. And we're seeing some markets go into recovery. Uh, of course, we're also seeing markets start to potentially come out of recovery. And then eventually we move into new normal. Much of the country is in this kind of recovery place, but we still have areas that are acute outbreak. So it means that the kind of messaging that you put towards people has to be really different. And so thankfully, there is a way to do that, right? The, the value of digital media means that we can place the right message in front of the right person at the right time, and we can try to do our very, very best to keep brands from being tenured and putting messages out to people who would find it really offensive and grotesque. So you, you mentioned something there. Really, it's about the voice of the customer. We t we've been talking before about how it's one-to-one -one advertisers to, to consumer. Uh, turn that around, consumer to brand. How has the dialogue changed? How's the narrative changed? Um, and, and do you think that'll continue? I, I think it is a, it's a continuation of what we've been seeing for a long time, which is the consumers taking a very strong voice. Their, vo you know, their voices are more shrill now than ever. And if you think about the concept of sort of cancel culture as a, as a shorthand for talking about the way that consumers interact with brands, 
we tend to act our most unskillfully when we're scared or when we're in pain. And I would say many people are one or both of those things much of the time. Um, we all see this in the interactions that we have with other people. Um, sometimes we've seen people come together in this. Sometimes we've seen people snap a lot more easily because they're just a bit freaked out. So we are seeing that that kind of anger with brands get even higher, and we've seen the appreciation with brands get even higher. So what we're seeing in so many areas is just a retreat from the middle. It's very barbell. Either a brand is amazing and they're incredible, and look at how Patagonia is just really supporting people, or they are they are just the devil. And um, you know, I think that's dangerous for brands because it means there's a lot of opportunities to screw up, right? We get 4,000 brand impressions a day as, uh, as, as consumers, and that's a lot of chances to make that one mistake. How about you, Autumn Tina? Do you see the same thing? Yeah, you know, we recently published a guide um, that had four stages of recovery. It's called How to Inspire Through Uncertainty. If anybody's interested in reading it, you can look for it on the Pinterest business website. Uh, but at this point in time, we actually believe we've already moved through the first two phases, which is a lot of what Andrew was describing, you know, phases that were all about triage and information in the beginning as people sort of were disoriented, didn't know what was happening. Um, and then moved into this um, stage of empathy and relevance where they kind of just wanted to hear that it was going to be okay and wanted to know that brands were there to support them. Um, we, I think we've probably all seen the compilation of messaging that came out during that phase where you know, a lot of brands were saying and echoing similar sentiments. Um, and now that now we've moved into a third phase that we're calling escapism and optimism. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we see signals on the platform that people are, are starting to think about the future. They want to be optimistic about the future and, and hope that you know, they can uh, take that vacation or celebrate with family and friends over the holidays. And I think the other thing that's coming with that is a sort of a sense of restlessness and even boredom. Um, so they want to kind of escape by, by planning that future. And I think this is a great time to shift messaging to be a little bit more inspirational and give people something to look forward to. Um, and then the next phase, and I think you know, some people are, are starting to move into this phase and certainly outside the U.S., you know, countries that were um, hit earlier with COVID-19 have already moved into that sort of final, you know, kind of rebound phase um, when people really start to, to rebuild. But I also think this is a, that's a critical phase for brands um, because people will have changed their habits, as we've talked about a little bit, and they expect brands to change as well. And it's going to be really important to really stand for something and share those values. Um, because brands that stand for something are ultimately going to stand out. And, and as people uh, look back on the brands that sort of help them through this very difficult time, they're going to have deeper connections to those brands. Autumn, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with Tina. I mean, just to build off that, you know, part of the research that we've done has shown that 72% of Americans say that they would support a brand that had taken action and helped communities during the pandemic. Um, and, and of course, we have a similar framework in terms of phases and, and, you know, currently we're still in the pandemic, we're preparing hopefully for recovery and then the new normal. Um, but I think that what we, what we see is that, to Tina's point, there's a little bit of fatigue. Um, and I hear that anecdotally, like at night, if, if all the commercials are themed around the pandemic, it's it can fly in the face of looking to entertainment for that comfort and that escapism that you mentioned. Um, but the way we look at it um, in terms of content, in terms of sponsorships and partnerships is uh, that these brands, first of all, people will remember how they showed up during this time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and secondly, what was that value exchange? And when you think about a value exchange, really all that means is that brands have the opportunity right now to, uh, to help communities through a lot of different avenues. That can be you know, acts of service through their, their brands and products. It can be through information. It can be through donations. It can be through entertaining content. And it can be through uh, assuring people that they're adopting new protocols for safety. Um, it can be through financial help to different communities. I mean, they're, really the point is that the way that your brand provides a value exchange with your audience and consumers 
has to credibly tie back to who you are as a brand, a service, and a product. Um, and I don't want to forget how you treat your employees as well. That's, that's definitely going to be something that consumers look at. But I think that we're all in it right now, but the consumers will be taking a look back and they will remember how brands showed up and what that what sort of value they did bring to the table. Um, and that will be important because actions speak louder than words. Well, and, and you, you all may have seen, many in the audience may have seen as well, there's a great site out there called didtheyhelp.com. And if you've had a chance to check out Did They Help, and I'll be all this in the chat just so that people, people have access to it, it is tracking what are people and brands doing, celebrities and, and companies during this time. Everything from how they're treating their employees, to obviously good point, to um, what they're doing with their, you know, they're putting their, their money where their mouths are. And they keep a leaderboard based on how people are, are acting. Uh, currently, uh, uh, Walmart and at and and TELUS at the top of the leaderboard. They're putting a lot of money towards things. They're helping people with their debt relief. And by the way, those are companies that do not have a great brand halo most of the time. Right, some you know the, the the phrase "never let a good crisis go to waste" has never been more true. You now have an opportunity if you're a brand that people love to hate to say we can really step up. We have the balance sheet to be able to extend 90 or 120 days of credit. We have the ability if you're Comcast to give uh, low income free internet access to people. At the same time, um, if you're Hobby Lobby, which is currently getting pilloried on that site. They are um, part of a, a group saying that, that um, you should open up the country and this is all, you know, it's a hoax. And, you know, there's, all, there's a, lot of, a lot of information happening on both sides. And um, it's really nice to see a pretty independent group starting to try to score that. And that's going to stick around. And Autumn's right and Tina's right. People are going to be looking at this data later and it will change the way people think about it. I, I like some of these adages we're hearing. My favorite one is it's never too late to ruin a first impression. And where these brands have you know, spent eons of, of time and effort and money um, and attention on consumers to build that brand loyalty, to build that relationship, uh, it's easily squandered at a time like this uh, should, you, should those brands fail to stand alongside of shoulder to shoulder with the consumers they service. Um, Andrew, have you seen other uh, anecdotes or stories that of, of successes like that? Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty interesting when you look at uh, some of the good news that's out there. Um, I mean, honestly, uh, we, we hear so much about the reduction in, in ad spend, but there are some brands that are doing really, really well during this, not just from a public relations and brand halo standpoint we were just talking about but from a you know, cold hard cash standpoint um, Facebook revenue is up 1.8 billion dollars uh, year over year um, they are you know there are many 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 more people using their platform than there were before and of course that was already pretty astronomical numbers so it, it, there's been an interesting pendular swing where for the last few years, being part of a large company has had a little bit of a feel of bad. And I think about it a lot very personally because you know, 20 years ago, I started a, started an agency with three people and somebody called me the other day, you're like a living Russian doll of agency consolidation. I now work for an agency that has 20,000 people in it. Um, and, I've, and there's been six names on the door, but I've worked for the same entity the whole time. So for quite a while, being part of a big thing was seen as bad. Big was just sort of bad, big was dumb and slow. Well, now suddenly, big companies, guess what? They have the balance sheet to outlast this. Um, whether you look at uh, consumer brands or you look at companies, um, it's very scary to work for a small company right now. Um, in the same time, after a 10 year bull market, we saw a lot of people say, I don't even know why I want a full time job. I can freelance and I can freelance at a higher rate. And um, I'll, I'll just do that. I can make more cash that way. Well, it's really interesting data from LinkedIn. Um, the LinkedIn Workforce Confidence Index has this scale of 100. And 100 is I'm 100% confident in my, my prospects for employment. So today, full-time people 
are on an average of 35, right? They have 35% confidence. So full-time people, are, they're nervous, but they are, you know, they're, they're, they're holding in there. So unemployed people have a confidence index of three. Freelancers have a confidence index that is below unemployed people. It is two. So currently the world's freelancers are more scared than the world's unemployed people. And that is, it, it is very interesting seeing people suddenly realize the value of being part of something a bit bigger and how scary it can be during difficult times when you're not. That's a, that's a great, that's a really, really interesting st statistic, Andrew. Thank you. Um, it occurs to me when we started all this, I didn't tell anybody what I do, which is um, I run the technology, media, and telecommunications group at a company called J.D. Power. J.D. Power, born in 1968, uh, reflecting the voice of consumers back to the brands that they do business with. Um, and I focus on, like I said, telecommunications, uh, technology, and media companies. And when you were saying what you were talking about before about how um, brands have been either beh behaving very well or failing the customers that they that they've built a relationship with, um, I, I want to point out and throw a, a you know a not so subtle sh uh, shout out to the telecommunications companies that have been keeping Americans connected. Um, you mentioned Comcast; they pulled the data caps off their their wireline industries, making sure people don't suddenly have a, a data overage uh, based on all the fantastic content they've been watching and binging on. Um, and similar things with uh, Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile have pulled um, uh, grandfathered plans that weren't unlimited into unlimited so that there isn't, again, a surprise. Um, what other brands have you seen? So I want to I talk a little bit about uh, that's uh, Autumn and Tina. What other brand uh, actions have you seen or have brands taken as a result of this need to stand shoulder to shoulder with your, cu with your customers that you've seen that you'd like to talk about? Well, one of our clients that uh, that acted quickly was Cottonelle with their Share a Square campaign that was tied to donations to the United Way, but also was a call to kindness to share if you if you had something of your own to share. Um, we've also seen uh, other clients kind of lean into the insight that this has been such an incredibly tough time, particularly for parents. Of small children, yeah. um, and so we've seen brands um, doing partnerships with with athletes, for example, where they do family workouts, and it's kind of a perfect storm of you know content that sports fans are excited to consume, uh, but totally relatable, right? Like, how do you get that workout in when you are, you know, uh, you have a toddler running after you all day, um, and so that that's a less serious. You know, it's, it's more of a content and entertainment play, but it's so appreciated. Um, and it, it acknowledges the hardship that a lot of consumers are facing right now. Yeah, I've been really inspired by the brands who have uh, really innovated in this time of crisis and, and really innovated to bring value to people. So, of course, there are all the companies that have shifted their production lines to producing PPE, ventilators and other much needed equipment, um, but also restaurants. Um, I also, in addition to entertainment, I also uh, cover strategy and marketing for the restaurant vertical. And in that space, there have been a lot of brands that have started selling food and grocery items that were hard to find at grocery. So there's national brands like um, Panera. They set up the Panera Pantry. Subway has also started to sell items um, that you you just can't get fresh, you know, sort of grocery items. Um, even my local coffee shop where I live is selling milk, eggs, bread, ice cream, you know, things that were never on their menu before to try to help people find those things. Um, and then I would say, you know, as a parent of a young child who is very bored at home and also um, an only child, I'm really actually quite grateful that some of the studios have begun to release first run family movies on premium VOD. Um, you know, we've watched uh, Scoob probably five times in the last few days, and uh, we watched Trolls before that. Um, and also the streaming services that have extended free trials and rolled out, you know, special pricing opportunities. 
Um, you know, I personally may have subscribed to a few new services in the last couple of months, um, but I feel like these are all things that are kind of helping people get by at home. Um, and again, I, I think it's really inspiring to see, you know, how brands have really risen to the occasion. Yeah, there's some, there's some pretty, pretty cool um, anecdotes and they happen kind of big and small. You know, I think some of this is translating being nimble with your social media into some, some action and seeing new avenues where people are. A couple of interesting examples. Um, Coors Light, you may have seen that woman named Catherine Pack put up a sign saying, I need more beer, right? And Coors Light brought her a bunch of beer to like an old woman who didn't want to leave her house and she wanted beer. And Coors is like, yeah, this is on brand for us, right? Like we got you, um, you know, Pepsi, Featured on on SGN, right? Some good news, which has become this kind of juggernaut. You know, John Krasinski acting really fast and both selflessly and, of course, selfishly, because boy, his brand couldn't be any better right now with the work that he's doing. Featuring Pepsi on Some Good News for giving three million dollars to Restaurant Employee Relief Fund with a you know big Pepsi logo made by his kids. That's an image seen around the world. Um, if you see, take a book brand like Fortnite. And what they did with Travis Scott, um, I mean, really a, a, a truly interesting way to use the medium to be able to have a have a concert. And um, you might argue better than going to a concert in a lot of ways, but doing something where people appreciate the platform, you get the PR, um, you're actually doing some good. Like There are ways to really make this work for you. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Krasinski's um, mode is, is fantastic currently. That that should be the high water mark going ahead. And I, I really like the statement you made where you say never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, certainly has capitalized on it in the best possible way. Um, speaking of, of capitalizing on a crisis, I wouldn't really call it that. But if you, you're all advertisers and, and, and brand focused, how would you advise, since we're talking about new streamers and new silos of content, how would you advise, um, or how would you have advised Quibi uh, since that launch, I don't think went the way they would have liked. And coming up soon, we have HBO Max about to, about to launch. How would you advise HBO Max? Um, and if they're a current client, say it in the hypothetical, um, to, to, ma to capitalize, I almost said maximize, to capitalize on um, where we're all at currently. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in because I think the, I thought a bit about the Quibi thing and um, I think they, uh, they had a real opportunity to tune as much of their programming as humanly possible to the crisis. So imagine if Quibi, and this, you know, this makes some stuff up, had said, we're going to start running content on the best way to be sanitary, on the best way to... Um, uh, brush up your resume on like trying to get creators who were at home to make content that was specifically helpful for people who were in COVID and categorizing that content around places that were in crisis, places that were in recovery and being, being able to turn it into a little bit of a resource um, rather than just saying, okay, we're going to stick to the playbook. Uh, so obviously they could have said we're not going to launch, but you know they wanted to launch. But they could have launched, and they could have added in content that gave them a good guy halo, and gave them a story, and maybe brought some people in who then might discover some of these shows that they're putting out. Um, th that would have been the way I would have tried to quickly pivot. I think um, one thing that that I think was tough for Quibi is that. The insight going into the launch was that we all are in love with our phones. That is a fact. <laughs> if you have a smartphone, I, I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I would guess that you'd give up a lot before you give up your phone. Um, but the pandemic changed that. Um, I'm on my phone more than ever. Um, I'm sure all of us get those horrific uh, statistics at the end of the week from our phones telling us how long we've been staring at the screen every day and not believing that that could possibly be true. Um, but but during the pandemic, I mean, I think 
we are all on our phones constantly because most of us are telecommuting or we're using mobile to interface with our loved ones or we are searching the news. Um, and so I think, you know, we're using our phones so much more that that second screen experience when you're watching content on a television and then second screening, you know, a game, uh, parallel content to that entertainment piece, whatever it might be, you know, that you're not looking for additional reasons to look at your phone. And I, I mean, that's more of my theory on it. Um, but, but I do feel like my relationship with my phone has changed since I have been staying at home. Um, and it's, it's now that my sidekick to content because I am constantly close to or near my television. Um, I, I'm sorry for grinning like a madman when you said second screen. I did a lot of work with that uh, eight, ten years ago, trying to create a parallel feed alongside of a main experience that you would be watching on your big TV. And I think at the time we saw people, it was, depending on who you asked, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of people were playing with their phones while watching TV. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that the opportunity for that, again, the, the, or how people have changed the relationship with their handhelds um, as a result of being constantly with them, right? If you're at work, you can't always have it, you know, right in front of your face. Um, whereas these days at home, it, it seems like, um, and especially with our children, with all the extra sc screen time they get these days, that the relationship has fundamentally changed. I Building on that... How has brand? How have brands uh, changed a strategy or maintained a strategy in light of the fact that um, that advertising opportunity or that impression opportunity has fundamentally changed? Well, um, actually, to build on what we were just talking about as well, um, and then I'll go to that. I also think the the relationship people have with entertainment has changed a little bit during you know this pandemic. Um, and we've kind of talked, we've been talking at Pinterest about the fact that, you know, based on the signals we're seeing that I talked about before, people living kind of their lives entirely in their homes. The home is sort of the new multiplex. And there's a lot of devices that are coming into play and a lot of choices that are coming into play when you've got an entire family under one roof and people who have different tastes and different needs for you know, content and entertainment. Um, and recently with the weather getting a little bit nicer, at least in some parts of the country, I'm in <laughs> Southern California, um, even this is extending to the outdoors. You know, we're seeing a lot of people planning um, to make movie night a big event at home. You can't go out to the movies anymore. So people are planning, you know, couples date movie night at home. And those are like literal searches that people are putting in backyard movie night, you know, movie night for the kids. And they're looking to make it special. And I think there's a huge opportunity in that for entertainment brands and entertainment marketers to capitalize on that and to sort of think a little bit differently about uh, the way they promote not just uh, their their latest new release or you know new original content, but also diving into the library. You know, there's been uh, so much that's been talked about about the psychological impact of watching shows you love, and we spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, the Simpsons that you have on your back wall there. And, you know, there's a, probably a great joy you get when you watch episodes you may have seen, you know, many times about The Simpsons. Um, so I think, again, for, for a lot of, especially these streaming services who have really rich, deep libraries, there's a great opportunity to kind of package the new with the, you know, the beloved um, and, and, put out sort of uh, suggestions to people when they're actively searching for them right now. You know, people have probably watched a lot of the, the things they plan to watch and are now kind of like going back to, to see if they could dig a little bit deeper into the well um, that all of these streaming services have, whether they're new like a Quibi or, you know, they've been around a while like a Netflix. It's a great observation. I, I, I know that I've do, dove through the uh, Disney plus Simpsons back catalog uh, <laughs> myself recently. Yeah, it's a it's a great opportunity to, to discover. Um, you know, it, it's funny. I think both for consumers and also on the kind of business side of, of media and advertising, um, we're seeing more and more relationships are everything. And where we have relationships, we're tending to strengthen those. And 
where our relationships were tenuous, they're going away. I'll, I'll give you a really interesting example. When, from an advertising agency standpoint, the, the clients with whom people tend to have the best relationships, their business is actually growing. Because when there's a crisis like this, what often happens is there's consolidation. Right? Companies say, we want to have less overhead, we want to put, put a lot of our business together in one place, maybe be able to, to have some negotiating power by doing that. And where the relationship was just okay, we're seeing actually a shocking number of agencies losing business and, and business turning over. So I, I've been really surprised. You would think that brands would take a time like this and say, we're not going to make any big changes. But if you look at the trades, really, really significant shifts are happening. And almost invariably, and, and I'm seeing this in, in my own business, we're seeing that where the relationships are good, they get even stronger. And if there was a crack in the relationship, boy, right now it shows. You mentioned before, Andrew, that the last thing you'd in the world you'd want to be doing right now is trying to book a, a, a national television uh, spot or, or campaign. So it seems like a great deal of money is coming out of broadcast advertising. Where's it going? And who are the, the really smart brands? What are they capitalizing on um, in that void? You know, it's a great question, and we are seeing it a lot. And um, again, I'm feeling really fortunate about being, as I have for a number of years, about being on the digital side of the business because that's where the money's going. We're seeing very, very, very significant cuts by brands to budgets that are focused on traditional media. Obviously, outdoor has, has been basically non existent. Uh, radio, terrestrial radio has been way, way, way down without drive time and commute time. And um, and TV has been way down. Even though people are watching from on TV, I think this is starting to expose a lot of what we've known but hasn't been reflected in the media spend for some time, which is not a lot of desirable audiences are watching at supported TV, uh, particularly sports off the air. So it's going to, to really well-targeted digital more than anywhere else. Um, and and I don't think it's going back because now more than ever, knowing precisely who you're talking to avoids some of those gaps that we all have been talking about and it lets you measure much more effectively than you could in the past. So, um, you know, we're seeing those shifts and folks that are a little uh, are quite heavy on the digital side, they're just not seeing the same cuts. Yeah, there's also, I think, a, a pricing advantage or value advantage to uh, moving to digital and, you know, particularly to auction based platforms right now with this, you know, incredible surge um, in, in usage that we're all seeing and we're certainly seeing it on our, our platform. You know, that money that might have previously been spent, you know, in an out of home campaign can really go a lot farther. Um, certainly on our platform and, and I'm sure on, on many other digital platforms. And the other thing too, I think is um, people, as I mentioned before, kind of looking for that, that positive sort of escape. And I think the environment in which you're placing your advertising right now really, really matters. And there are a lot of places right now that I think advertisers should really think about what they might be showing up against. You know, that's one of the things um, that I personally love about Pinterest. And, you know, I, I know you're a user and you probably do too, is that um, it's not social in the way we typically define social, um, where there's kind of a lot of back and forth. It's it's more personal because um, you go there to find ideas for yourself, for your own life um, and for, for what you're looking for. And you're really not going to end up next to content that could be quite negative or, you know, even sad or depressing, you know, given what's going on in the world. You're not going to get bad news about a loved one a, some, for someone adjacent to, you know, a, an ad you might be placing for, you know, a new show. I, I wanted to pop in real quick and let the audience know, go ahead and submit your questions uh, through the, the chat function there, and I'll, we'll try to get to them in our remaining time. Um, you, you mentioned those those um, where your ads might appear, Tina. I think that's a, that's a really interesting point. Um, cre how, how do brands guarantee in a non ad supported world, right, uh, in media, and obviously it's going to be a little bit different digitally. How, how do you guarantee? How do you look for? Is it is it via a roadblock? 
kind of ad buy. I want to consume all of the available inventory around a certain day, part or time or moment or, or a piece of media. How do you, how do you guarantee, how do you protect your brand in that, in, in that kind of, um, in that kind of a way? No, that's like, an actual question. I don't know how to do it. I, I'd, <laughs> I'd love to hear from the experts, please. Well, my expertise is in sponsorships and partnerships. And I think that the way we approach it is, I mean, obviously brand safety is always really, really important and we have stringent processes. Um, but I think what we look to do is to, to heavily curate, you know, from a sponsorship partnership content perspective, what those messages are going to be. Um, and then on the brand safety side, obviously you're paying attention to a, a digital environment. A lot of times, um, sometimes it'll be on a major league sports website or, um, or you know, an affiliated um, content website. But for us, uh, it all comes back to, to brand safety, which I am not an expert in. Um, and so for us, what, what we really do in conjunction with the experts at Mindshare who, who know how to, to handle that, um, is really curating the message itself. And to ladder on to what Tina was saying before, like for us right now, you know, the tonality of, of empathy and, uh, and also providing value um, is something that we're really leaning into as well as the entertainment of, of fan communities and places where people can gather and, and feel good about something that they're really passionate about. Um, that's that's something that's really um, important right now as people feel isolated and are looking to to gather with like-minded friends. Yeah, and you know, for us, um, I mean, our our users or pinners um, have been taking to social media, other social media platforms, to actually share out how Pinterest has been a great break for them. You know, it's sort of like that that positive corner of the internet that they can go to escape kind of the news of the day. Um, and, you know, dream about the future. But also um, for us, our users curate their own experience, you know, by interacting with different content. And a lot of that content comes from brands. It's going to custom curate the experience that you're going to see on your feed. And, you know, even if all three of us like the same types of interests, we're going to have really different feeds based on the specific content that we're curating. And so I'd say that for advertisers, Pinterest is really quite a a safe and positive environment to show up in every day, but certainly right now, you know, when when so much of the news of the day again is is can be quite bleak and uh, yeah. depressing. That you know that that, that interest in positivity is so strong, Tina, and and I, I think you're you're right. It, you're at, you're at that place. I mean, in many best in many of the best practices are the best practices that are universal. Um, we've been trying to give people a really simple rubric for, particularly in that acute phase. Um, one, make sure that your your purpose is is true to your brand. Uh, don't be a caregiver of brand if you're not. Right? Don't don't make it up and pretend. Um, be incredibly simple. People are overwhelmed and they can't take much in. Flexibility since things are changing daily and being very flexible with your brand. And then incredibly transparent. Right? Tell people what you're what you're up to. Um, you know, I think that we are seeing. Uh, Brands that are helpful, inclusive, caring, and empathetic. Once you start to be in that kind of bit more recovery phase, um, they're they're really getting well regarded. So I'd like to say it's not that hard. It's it's quite it's quite simple. It can be quite straightforward. And again, many of the things that brands should do all the time, but they don't always. Yeah, you're reminding me of a, a quote uh, that our CMO recently shared with us as one of her favorite quotes, which is the best way to predict the future is to create it, which seems you know, particularly on point uh, at this moment in time. And, and the truth is that we all have a role in envisioning what comes next and brands play a really big role in helping to envision that future. Definitely. And one thing we talk a lot about is that once we are past that recovery phase and into the new normal, that there's gonna be such a celebration of sports and gatherings and going shopping at the stores that you like and grocery shopping and all these things that were either errands or recreation before that we all took for granted and that there will be such a resurgence. Um, and, and brands can play a role there and be a part of that celebration and positively augment those experiences. 
um, so that when when we do come rushing back together and we can shake hands, um, that that they have a role there, and it, it has to be the credible role. It can't be you know a, a cut and paste role, um, but they do play a role in in that celebration of, of coming back together. I don't I don't know if we'll ever shake hands again, and uh, <laughs> and boy, it couldn't be too soon for me. I, it, it, <laughs> of the probably, you know, it's fascinating to see infections of all things are getting way, way, way down because we all wash our hands more and we don't like kiss on the cheek and shake hands. So I'll be delighted to see all that stuff go up. At least a high five. Yeah, elbow bump, right? Elbow bump. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of funny. Um, I, I also want to congratulate all of us on the call that we've managed to make it uh, almost an hour without a toddler or dog interruption. It's it's so uncommon to be able to get through a day like that. Um, before we were talking about advertising inventory and how the shift from broadcast to digital has, has largely occurred at this point, um, talk a little bit about the advantages there, right? Because obviously, you know, everybody knows the Wanamaker paradigm. Um, I know half my, my impressions are wasted. I just don't know which half and that's in broadcasting and digital. It's significantly different. You know who you're advertising to and you know a great deal about them. Um, is that, is that the, the motivating force behind that? Or is it that the audience has moved um, because we're all binging so heavily on, on silos? Talk a little bit about the, the difference in, in, in how that's happened, if you may. In general, I think... Go oh, Sorry. You know, uh, in general, I think messaging is less effective than experiences. And again, I think that's something that we've seen growing and never more than now. Um, I think things that feel like just straight up advertising versus a way of kind of sharing experience. And by the way, you can even share an experience through a 30 second spot, talking about what your brand is doing and telling, telling some real stories. But um, I think we're seeing that kind of urge to be part of something. And um, uh, companies that are investing in experiences tend to be getting more uh, customer feedback and more customer loyalty in this phase than even, even, even before. Yeah. And I think certainly, you know, a lot of it is being driven by where people are spending time right now. But I would also say that, you know, like certainly the way we look at it um, on Pinterest is the ads are content. I mean, people come to Pinterest because they want to find ideas that they can then go and execute in the real world, in their lives. And, you know, a lot of times right now that has to do with, again, those things you're looking for your home. But um, it's it's actually providing content that people can go and do something with um, versus just kind of, you know, talking to them, you know, with a message that isn't really going to be actionable in the same way. Less yeah. talking to them and more with them. Helping them. Yeah. Helping and guide them through this and giving them solutions, you know, for some of the needs that we have right now. Yeah, I'm building on that. You know, one of the things we've seen in our COVID study is that there's a huge amount of people who have now taken this opportunity to do DIY projects, take up a hobby. Uh, a huge percentage of millennials have adopted or uh, now have a pet of their own. Um, so we are seeing these really interesting lifestyle changes. Uh, that's a big deal to to bring an animal into your home, and uh, you know, so and also. We've been such a entertainment heavy culture, you know, the idea and, and I'm sure Tina knows the other side of that. But I, I would say even people who have been heavy entertainment consumers who haven't necessarily wanted to do a sourdough starter or start a giant puzzle or build a shed in their backyard. You know, this time at home with no commute for, for many of us. Uh, does open the door to, and also unemployment, unfortunately, you know, has has mm -hmm. opened the door to a, a lot of, uh, you know, activities that, that I think a lot of us maybe didn't have time for or couldn't prioritize previously. And I think that those are going to have a major impact um, on future behaviors. I mean, right now we're seeing huge adoption of things like delivery services and you know, restaurants have pivoted to to take out and whatnot. We're even seeing bodegas open up in our favorite pizza joint uh, where you can get eggs and bread. And, and I think right now, of course, everything, you know, B 
being digital is, is sanitary um, or more sanitary than, than going to a store and standing in a line with a mask. Um, but I also think that there's going to be a ton of innovation and cultural shifts coming out of this, like a, a huge percentage of people having a pet. You know, that's going to be a huge insight moving forward or people being more passionate about their personal projects versus, you know, maybe choosing to, to turn on the TV. Um, that, that these are behaviors that will have, you know, long-standing effects. Autumn, you know, we, of, you're, you, go ahead, Tina. Uh, so you totally nailed it about, you know, people kind of like, planning different you know, projects, big and small. Um, we commonly see people setting up boards that are titled inspirational, that they can save their ideas and content onto. Well, during this time, we've seen a, over a 400% increase in people creating boards titled inspirational. So we know that you know, that's an important piece of, of how they're using our platform and, and really what they need for their lives right now. And even though those feel analog, they will give birth to new forms of media and new ways of advertisers communicating to people. You know, it will just, it'll give birth to, to a new industry and a new way of, of interacting with people and their personal passions. Autumn, speaking of celebration and adoption, you shared something pre-show that I think is, a, is a, about millennials and, and pets that I think is a wonderful thing to, to repeat, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. So as specific statistic, hold on here, um, is that 58% of millennials have adopted or fostered a pet since the pandemic began. Um, and so we were talking about how amazing is that, you know, a, a problem like a pet adoption and, and all of these animals that don't have homes and 58%. I mean, that's tremendous. If you think about it, it's only going back a couple of months. That's incredible. So, that, so there that's are a celebration. That are empty now. That every pet has been adopted. They they are they are cleared out. Um, and honestly, there's never been a better time to train, a, to train an animal. You're all all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that's truly a, a celebration indeed. So with the with the remaining minute, I've got one question here from um, from, from the audience. It's not quite uh, what we were just talking about, but it's interesting. People have been gravitating towards more authentic and real advertising experiences even before COVID, with more celebrities and athletes showing up online without makeup and revealing themselves in candid moments. Will very professionally polished ads with beautiful actors and lots of video effects become less attractive in the years after COVID? No way. Right out there. As I don't think as, so. <laughs> as soon as the stylists can can get to them, they uh, they will. There will yeah. always be occasional pretty piece that is done for effect, but uh, no, this is not a choice that they're making. This is a necessity. I think being genuine and and having empathy and telling a human story can be done with incredible production value. Uh, I think right now we're seeing a lot of commercials that show us all on on. Uh, video conferencing and, and whatnot. And that is real for today. That is the human experience for a lot of us. But I do think that telling a human story um, can be beautifully produced. I was just reading an article um, actually last night about the virtual graduation ceremony that LeBron James just hosted. And uh, the article was talking about how they actually had quite high production value and figured out how to do that in a very kind of safe and social distance manner. He was alone in, you know, a studio and uh, the value was still there and, and really like how Hollywood is now trying to figure out how to pull off uh, a production, you know, particularly with unscripted where maybe you have a completely contained environment for you know the the talent that is on the show, um, and I think that Hollywood has always shown they can innovate and uh, they can sort of rise to the occasion when uh, something comes along that tests the abilities, and and I do believe that we'll see that happen. Um, and absolutely, people and viewers will have an appetite to see you know professional content. Excellent. So with that, I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I want to thank, I want to absolutely thank uh, Tina Pukonen for, for, for joining us, Andrew Somson, Autumn Nazarian. Thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us and talking about where we're going next um, with advertising, creativity, branding strategy uh, at this time. 
Audience, thank you. My name is Ian Greenblatt, um, and I really appreciate you spending this time with us. Take care. Be safe. Be well. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.